are high and lifted up. Archbishop Dominica Bierman has traveled the world for over three decades proclaiming the gospel from Zion to the nations with miracles following. She exposes the false doctrines of replacement theology and preaches restoration to the Jewish Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, welcome to one of my most favorite sites in Israel. We are at the source of one of the rivers that make the Jordan River, which is the Banias River. Now, it's interesting that Banias is the name, but actually it's commemorating a certain god that was worshipped in this area, which was called the god Pan. And you can see right behind my back there on the mountain carved that altar to the god Pan that was half goat and half man. We're going to take about this because some people think, well, that's mythology, that's simply all kinds of fables, but actually it's reality. And I will explain why this is reality and why this place is so important. Now, besides telling you that, when we go upstairs to visit, we're going to see a Byzantine church that has altars that has incorporated within its structure the altars to the god Pan and the altars to the god Jupiter, kind of Pan and Jupiter together, incorporated within the walls and the structure of the Byzantine church. You're going to see it very graphically how this could happen and what's the connection between Christianity and between uh, the Pan God and Zeus and this area. Now, first of all, this area itself, we are at the foot of Mount Hermon. Now, according to some recounts, especially from the book of Enoch, the original writings of Enoch that called the Ethiopic writings, it was at the foot of Mount Hermon that the greatest treason in history happened. What was the greatest treason in history? It's described in Genesis chapter 5. And in Genesis 6, it says that there was these sons of Elohim, which are fallen angels. Can you say fallen angels? And they came down and they mated with the daughters of men. Okay, according to Enoch, and also I believe that's pretty good, um, Enoch, you know, walked with Elohim and then he was taken up midlife because he walked so close to God. But according to Enoch, the mating happened with the daughters of Cain. Because understand that in Genesis 5, it was before the flood and therefore, uh, Cain and the daughters of Cain and the line of Cain was still alive. And that would have been the line that would have mated with the fallen gods. It was the line that was marked literally for destruction because Cain murdered his brother Abel. And another question that arises when you think about that is this. How can it be that from the same man and woman we could have an Abel and we could have a cane. We can pose that question later on when Rebecca gives birth to Jacob and to Esau. How can it be from the same woman? One is devoted for destruction or is under a curse. The other one is actually the favored seed. I'm not going to necessarily talk about it completely today, but I will touch on these things because it's all about the seed. Can you say that with me? It's all about the seed. Do you know that in the Torah it says that Elohim hates mixed seed? In other words, when we make hybrid seeds or when we even wear, let's say, cotton and wool together. Wool comes from the animals, cotton comes from the ground, right? Or, or when we sow a seed with mixed seeds that intertwine and kind of make a hybrid. In other words, Elohim saying he doesn't like the hybrid. But we see here that the God that used to be worshipped during the Canaanite period and later on, all the way even until maybe the, 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 the coming of Yeshua and even later, it was a hybrid between a goat and a man. Well, we know, for example, that the fallen angels mated 
with the daughters of men. However, the fallen angels also mated with animals. One of the things that the Torah completely forbade was bestiality. In other words, the mixing of human seed with beasts or with animals. So again, you see this thing coming up. So this God probably was a real person and he is still, and his name was Pan. From that comes the word Banias, which is Panias, or the source of the worship of the god Pan flowing into a river. You will find out that a lot of idolatry happens in the high places and at the mouths of rivers. Why? Because the, uh, the demons and the fallen angels, they know how the spiritual things happen in the kingdom. So they are brought in normally from the high places in order to uh, affect and influence a lot of territory and from the mouth of rivers because the water carries the vibrations of that worship. That's the reason why, for example, blowing the shofars into river sources, blowing the shofars into oceans and into seas is very effective. Also going to blow the shofars in high places, very effective because it carries the sound and it affects large amount of areas. The river keeps on flowing until it ends. So it affects all of that area and the water carries the sound. The water absorbs the sound. It absorbs the spirit, whatever spirit that may be. That's the reason why when we talk about the Garden of Eden or when we talk about the third heavens, we know that there is a river of life and there is trees that give fruit every month. Hallelujah. We also see that river in Ezekiel 44 that comes from under the throne of Elohim and that river is a living river, is a living water. It carries the power, the anointing, the glory of the Creator. In the same way, rivers can be polluted physically and spiritually. These kind of truths have not been known much by the Christians because of the mixture with replacement theology. So what has happened is that this mixture with replacement theology created a hybrid religious system, a hybrid religious system that had part worship to the God of Israel, part worship to the Pan God and to Zeus and to different gods. You know, lately we know that Jonathan Kahn wrote a book called The Return of the Gods. The Return of the Gods means that the gods are going to be manifesting again. The same gods of mythology, the same gods that we find here, their altars, will be manifesting again, except I actually claim something different. Not only the return of the gods, but that rather the gods have been hiding in plain sight and they've been hiding inside of the church. They've been hiding because there's been a mixed altar between Zeus and, well, Yeshua or Jesus Christ, that many people called him Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to explain this mixture, but first I wanna give you some historical recount. We're gonna understand how Yah hates the mixture and how he wants to purify the bride. Many years ago, well, actually, by 94, I, I published a book called The Healing Power of the Roots. And in that book, I quoted a prophecy that Yah gave me. And the prophecy was this. It was that, because I asked him a question when I was ministering in Switzerland, my first Back to the Roots seminar, and I said, why is it so important to preach the, the Jewish roots to the church? And he said to me, it's a matter of life and death because the church has been like a beautiful rose cut off from her garden, which is the olive tree, Romans 11, the olive tree, the covenants with Israel, Israel, the Jewish Messiah, the Torah in the spirit, uh, the, the biblical feast, all of that cut from her garden and put in a vase of water for two days. One day is like 1,000 years to Yahweh, 
two days is like 2,000 years, the third day is the third millennium. And he said to me, if she's not replanted back on the third day, she will surely die. The reason why this would happen is because of the mixture with pagan worship and with biblical worship. In other words, the moment that there is a mixture, there is an open door to the enemy to come in and to destroy that place of mixture. Because of the mercy of Yah, it hasn't fully happened, but it's been in stages. But right now, many people call, for example, Europe post-Christian Europe. They call America post-Christian America. Why would they call Europe post-Christian Europe post-Christian America? Because for the most part, there's been an exodus of the Christians outside of their churches and outside of their denominations because I believe it is Yah that is dismantling everything to be able to rebuild it back on the right foundation without the mixture that was borrowed from uh, the Roman, Greco-Roman pantheon that had the Pan God, that had the Jupiter and the Zeus God and everything else, borrowing the feast from there like Christmas and Easter and Halloween, changing the Shabbat from Sunday, which is the, the day of sun worship, all of these things. So Yah has been dismantling everything so he can actually reform it and transform it and put it back on the right foundation. There is no other place better to explain this than actually the Banias site or the Panias site. No other place. When you go and see up there the altar to the Pan God right there in the apsis or the altar of the Byzantine church that you can see it right behind my back so this is a very good view of it you will understand that from the inception of Christianity, it was a hybrid religion between sun worship and, and foreign gods worship and between biblical worship. In other words, the people that grew up out of that system, and therefore we understand what happens when the Catholic Church now can incorporate saints and statues and the worship of the Queen of Heaven, Mary, and all of these things, it was very easy to do because it was the mixture already there because Constantine on the fourth century said very clearly in the Council of Nicaea, let us separate ourselves from the detestable company of the Jews for the Savior has showed us a better way. And a better way and another way was another gospel that came in instead of the Jewish Savior, a Greco-Roman Savior. Instead of biblical feast, pagan feast dressed as if it were to be in biblical garbs, as if it was connected to things that the Lord did here, there, and everywhere, if it is his birth, if it is his death, burial, and resurrection, if it is the day of worship, all of these things borrow from the Greco-Roman pagan calendar. And so really the destruction of what we call the church, which I will change the name to the Ecclesia, or the called out ones, that congregation of believers that comes out of Jew and Gentile, forming the bride of Messiah, forming one new man, that destruction already starts in the second and the third century, but gets solidified as law, as a contract through the Council of Nicaea on the fourth century. And we go to Romans 11 and it says that some branches, Jewish branches have been broken off, but you being wild olive trees, you've been uh, grafted into the original cultivated olive tree. And it says that if some branches were broken off, do not be arrogant against those Jewish branches because if you are not, if you're not merciful, then you will also be cut off. And a lot of people have been cut off throughout the ages because of anti-Semitism and all of that. But what brought this about 
was the fury of the enemy, Satan, against Israel, against the Jewish people. And so the moment it infiltrated this one new man, this, this church, this called out ones, this bride of Messiah, Jew and Gentile, that became one already in the first century, the moment it infiltrated that, then anti-Semitism got solidified as Christian doctrine. And so you should not be Judaizing and the Jews have been under a curse forever and they'll never be forgiven. And now the church has replaced Israel and the Torah is done away with. Now we have the New Testament now. We want to understand that Timothy and Paul never spoke about the New Testament. It was not canonized until the fourth century, but they actually um, talked about the Hebrew Holy Scriptures. Okay, now let's take a look at what happened here. This has been a lot of Israeli researchers that have researched this area. It says this, an Israeli team of researchers excavating a Byzantine church in Banias Nature Reserve in northern Israel, believed to be from the 400 AD. 400 AD means after the Council of Nicaea that happens 325 AD. In other words, the church already had separated because Constantine said, let us separate ourselves from the detestable company of the Jews for the Savior has showed us another way. And therefore another gospel came in. Paul said, woe to those that preach another gospel. And woes came and that church became very dark until the Dark Ages came and was still recovering territory from the Dark Ages. So, so keep that in mind, the timing. Say timing. So they excavated here and they found from the 400 AD recently discovered a Roman era temple to the Greek god Pan beneath the church and made another find that sheds further light on the way that the lives of the later Christians were intertwined with those who worshipped the earlier faiths. That means they worshipped the gods, like the pan god and Zeus. So according to these researchers, the, er, the, these latter Christians, it was not the ones of the first century, but the ones of the second and third and fourth centuries, the faith in the Messiah, the faith in the Savior was intertwined. Can you say intertwined? Mixed with the earlier faiths, meaning pre-Messiah, meaning BC. A second and third century AD altar with a Greek inscription found in the walls of the church. Where it was found? in the walls of the church. The church which is one of the oldest ever found. Say one of the oldest ever found. We're talking about the inception of Christianity as a religious system. So the church which is one of the oldest ever found was important to early Christians according to Professor Adi Ehrlich of the Zinman Institute of Archaeology the University of Haifa, who is leading the excavation of the site with Professor Ron Lavie, these very well-reputed professors. This site would have had tremendous significance, say tremendous, significance for Christians of the Byzantine era who believe that this is where Jesus told Peter, I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, said early. So what have we learned from this? We've learned here that Israeli archaeologists that have dug in this place have found out that the Christians of the 4th century, their faith was intertwined with the faith of the god Pan and of the god Zeus that have their temples beneath the church, incorporated into the Christian church worship. Now, we understand that this is one of the oldest churches. Not only that, we also know that this was a place of great pilgrimage. In other words, we had Christians from all over 
the Roman and Byzantine Empire coming to worship here at the foot of Mount Hermon at this Byzantine church that was mixed with the altars of the Pan God and of the Zeus God and it was regarded to be a very important and high place of worship. Now, what is the Byzantine Empire? We talk Byzantine, Byzantine, but what's Byzantine? Okay, until Constantine makes Christianity the, re the, re the religion of the Ro Eastern Roman Empire, all of it was Roman Empire, but Constantine won the war and obtained the crown over the eastern part of the Roman Empire, made it Christian. It wasn't really Christian. Understand that the, the real name of the believers of the first century wasn't Christian. They were called Christians in Antioch, but we need to understand the background of that because it was a derogatory term historically because there was some people called Christians at the time and they used to worship the god Christos and they used to do miracles in the name of the god Christos and because these believers in Yeshua, Jew and Gentile in Antioch, they were doing miracles into the name of Yeshua, then the peoples around said these are like the Christians and eventually changed into Christians and then it was adopted by Constantine to create a religion that was already in the making because in the second and third century the disciples of Yeshua that had known him have already died and there was an influx of Romans and Greek pagans that was believing in this God that was called Jesus Christ, the name was beginning to change to Jesus Christos for the same reason that the Christians, the Christians were called like that because there was a, derog a derogatory tone saying, oh, you're healing just like the Christians. And then it changed to Christians, then Constantine adopted it, and then he also solidified the divorce between the Jewish Messiah Yeshua with his name, with his Torah, with his people, to the Greco-Roman Jesus Christ with pagan feasts borrowed from the Greco-Roman calendar and from Zeus and Jupiter and Tammuz and Pan and everything else. Now, it's very interesting though that this was the place where Yeshua in the book of Matthew gives the keys of the kingdom to Shimon Peter. It is this place where he asks him, who do you say I am? And of course they said, well, you know, maybe Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets or, you know, people say that. But then he said, but what, who do you say? I am. Who do you say I am? What is your revelation? That's a good question that we should ask ourselves today. What is your revelation that he is? And Peter said, Shimon said, you are the anointed one, the Mashiach, the Messiah, the Messiah, the son of the living God. And then he said, blessed are you, Peter, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. Okay? This is the place. Now why on earth would he say, and I give you the keys of the kingdom, so that I will build my ecclesia, I will build my called out one kehila community of believers, and the gates of Sheol, the gates of hell, will not prevail against it. Why? Why would he do it here? The message and the location are important. Elohim is an Elohim of word and location. And therefore, he actually, uh, you know, when he gives the land of Israel, is about location, isn't it? From the Nile to the Euphrates, location, location, location. When it's a temple mount, it's location, isn't it? It's both the message and the location. Say with me, message, 
and location. That's why the enemy seeks to confuse the locations. But he chose this area. Why? Because according to the scriptures, Yeshua was in Caesarea Philippi. And we are in the area of Caesarea Philippi today. And here it is that he chooses to give the keys of the kingdom, the authority that whatever you bind on earth, whatever you forbid on earth is forbidden in heaven, here, and it is here that he said, I give you the keys of the kingdom and the gate of the underworld. Say the underworld. underworld. Will not prevail against it. Why here? Because this is the foot of Mount Hermon. And this is the place where the highest treason happened in Genesis 5. When the fallen angels came mated with the daughters of Cain. And these gods came into being. These gods that mix with men. And their offspring were hybrids. Some of them were giants that had six fingers. And they were all over the Golan Heights. And the Og, the king of Bashan, and the Umim, and the Zamzumim, and the Rephaim, and all of those Anakim, all of these giants, they were all over the Golan Heights. It was full of them. And then when the tribes come in, and then they defeat all of these, and they are given also the, the, um, the eastern side of the Jordan River where all those Anakim were, where all those giants were, there was a mixed breed. But we are talking about after the flood, when Genesis 5 happens before the flood. So how can it be that we find giants after the flood? I mean, after all, during the flood, everybody was destroyed because of the mixed breed. Okay, that's the reason. If you want to know why Elohim decided to wipe out all of humanity, it was because it was so mixed with fallen angels, with his, with his gods, and, and there was such a hybrid race that he couldn't rescue that race anymore. And he called Noah, that was of the holy seed, that was untainted. Why did he call Noah? And he said that Noah was righteous in his generation. It wasn't only because he was perfect and was doing everything right. It was because his seed, his sons, okay, are you hearing me? They were not mixed with hybrid race. In other words, they are preserved the seed that came all the way, hallelujah, from Adam through Abel and then Shet. Abel was killed by Cain, but then Shet was born. The seed that comes from Shet or from Set, which is the son that was given to them after Abel was killed. And the holy seed kept on going from that seed. Have you, have you wondered to yourself why Elohim would say, for example, blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven? Why would he blot out the memory of Amalek? Because it was mixed with hybrid seed. Wherever there's an entire race that is mixed with hybrid seed, that race will be devoted for destruction. This message by Archbishop Dominica Bierman will continue in the next Prepare the Way program. In this tour, I thought, revelation or revelation or revelation. And it's not new. I knew it before, but it is, it is confirming and it is, um, it is rooted deeper in. And yeah, it is, it changed everything. It changed everything. For you are high and lifted up, yes, you are high and lifted up, and your glory fills your temple, yes, your 